Hi, everybody. Cheryl Ackeson here. Welcome to another edition of the Cheryl Ackeson podcast on justthenews.com. I hope you'll check out all the Just the News podcasts. You can go to justthenews.com and see the list of these podcasts on the homepage. Today, the stunning scope of COVID-19 relief fraud, your tax money, and one of the main men who's in charge of trying to track it all down. Hey, my wife, Judy, and my son, Josh, and I, every couple months, we like to go to the local animal shelter, help out the great volunteers and workers there, and to give some comfort and some fun to the pets that may be a hold up there. Well, if you're a cat lover, here's some big news. Arm & Hammer Cat Litter has a great new contest, the Unsung Heroes Giveaway. It honors staff and volunteers at animal shelters, the Unsung Heroes, who go above and beyond to help perfectly imperfect shelter cats by meeting their physical, medical, and emotional needs. These people are amazing. we got to reward them. Now, there are huge prizes like $30,000 for shelters, a year of free kitty litter, awards for compassion and creativity, and a chance to be named, get a load of this, Advocate of the Year. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Hurry up. This contest ends November 22nd. Enter now for official rules. And to learn more, go to FelineGenerousHeroes.com. Let me give you that again. FelineGenerousHeroes.com. I've been reporting on waste, fraud, and abuse of taxpayer funds for so long, and there's so much of it, it starts to feel as if I'm reporting different versions of the same story over and over again. Such is the case with my reporting on COVID-19 relief fund fraud. Here's how the basic stories always seem to go. There's some sort of emergency or a government decision to make a giant government expenditure of taxpayer money. It could be natural disaster relief, COVID, economic stimulus. Billions and billions, or maybe even trillions, go out the door quickly. Almost immediately, there are stories of waste, fraud, and abuse. A small group of watchdogs and prosecutors cannot possibly wrap their hands around the scope of the fraud, but they get to what they can. And then when I interview officials, they commonly say the following— no matter which side of the political aisle they're on, they say, well, we always know there's a trade-off. We have to get the taxpayer money out quickly to the people who need it, which means we don't necessarily have systems in place or a great way to avoid some of the fraud, because if we're more careful, it will muck up the money for the great majority of honest people who need it fast. But after covering these stories for a long time and talking to the watchdogs, the men and women who oversee the spending and try to track down the problems... I don't think it's what we now call a binary choice, whether we get the money out fast and accept lots of fraud, or we get it out slowly and have less fraud. And I discussed this very point with Small Business Administration IG Inspector General Mike Ware recently, who you'll hear from in just a moment. Mike Ware, like other government officials I've spoken to who go after all the fraud, agree that we seem to try to reinvent the wheel every time there's another crisis or big government spending program, as if we've never done it before and have to start from scratch putting systems in place to prevent problems after the fact. But the fact is, it seems pretty clear there are basic steps that can and should be taken every time the government funds go out the door. And there could be an established protocol that's set up on an ongoing basis that's always followed. There's an emergency or crisis or a big chunk of government spending. Well, you open the book figuratively. And here are the simple checks and balances that must be in place on the front end that are not time consuming and will not result in great delays, but ensure there is less fraud. Case in point, you'll hear from IG Ware that at the beginning of the government's COVID-19 relief paycheck protection program, These involve loans that were given out that are forgivable, meaning for the most part, it's free cash that people don't have to pay back. Well, he says participating banks weren't even required to ask the simplest questions and ask for the very basic documentation or piece of paper from a supposed business person applying for money to show that they even owned a business or had any employees. And sometimes these people were getting millions of dollars. That's led to untold millions and millions being taken by cons and fraudsters. I'll let Mike Ware take it from there. Again, 
He's Inspector General of the Small Business Administration, which administers a great deal of the COVID-19 relief money. There's always an element of fraud with any pool of money. Definitely, and, and knowing that from our experience of being in, the, in this business for so many years, that's how we were able to get out in front of it with um, the, the, the early on reports that we gave to the agency. We knew immediately, listen, we're going to have to try to get them to put some guardrails over this. And because even in the best of circumstances, fraudsters do what fraudsters are going to do. So, I mean, what we have said from the beginning would mitigate the risk of a lot of what we're seeing now in terms of our casework. But there's probably, there'll, there'll always be some opportunity for fraudsters to get creative. You published a flash report in May, which resulted in legislative changes. So is that saying that early on there was immediate red flags? Oh, definitely. Well, well early on, we, what that report sought to do was to say, hey, there's some things that you probably want to change. One, you're not going to know if you are giving any type of help to what you would call um, the underserved markets because you're not tracking it. Nobody's taking a look at this. You're only going to be able to guess. We'll, we'll, we'll still probably not know because at the onset, it, it wasn't in place. So we were like, hey, you guys need to make sure that you track this so that we know what whether or not the intention of the programs were, were actually and met. And who are you telling, Congress or the so SBA? It's, it's, it's a, a nice dynamic in terms of being an IG. So my role is I must keep Congress and the administrator fully and currently informed. So that's simultaneous. So I had to keep my messages both to Congress and to the administrator. What was your first clue that there was going to be an element, a large element of fraud possible? As soon as we started to hear what the numbers were in terms of how much money was going to be allocated to these programs, immediately, we knew it because we had a, a large body of previous work that we had conducted over decades. And the most recent one was um, dealing with um, ARA. So we, we had a, a body of work on that where we saw what the, the, stim the stimulus program, the stimulus program, where we saw anytime this amount of money comes and it goes out that quickly, these are the type of schemes that we know are going to be coming our way and these are the type of mechanisms or controls we think need to be in place up front to mitigate the risk of fraud. How does this scope compare with other money that has had to be watched over in the past? There, there's no comparison. This, this is so much larger than, than, than the Recovery Act, for example. Um, we just, what, less... At the time when I, when I ran the numbers, we were at probably the year, one year mark on it. And the amount of fraud and the amount of recoveries, the amount of arrests, the amount of convictions that we had achieved just one year in is greater than the number that was done under the Recovery Act in total. It said based on prior work and analysis of loan data you identified at the time, 70,835 loans, <laughs> $4.6 billion in potentially fraudulent PPP loans. That's a huge number, $4.6 billion. Yeah, it, 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 it's, a huge, it's a huge number. And that's the way I look at it. I look at it straight up at numbers. Other people like to dissect it. Well, it's only X amount of percent of the, of the pool. And I say, what is $4.6 billion? $4.6 billion that we are accountable for. So... And then $79.1 billion as of February 28th, potentially fraudulent EIDLs and emergency grants. Yes. And that's the one, that program is the one that gives us the most pause. Why is that? Well, that's a direct lending program from the Small Business Administration. The Paycheck Protection Program is administered through the, the banks and lending institutions. They're accustomed to doing that. Not that SBA isn't but they have a lot more control structure in place. People in have to, to go to things. the bank to get the money. People have to do the, go to the bank to get the money. And it was the banks up front who were partnering with us from the onset to say, hey, we have a problem. These deposits are going into their accounts from the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, IDLE program, where these people never had a business. We asked them a simple question on your business or no. It's because it was um, up to $10,000 at the time. 
So and those, they have to have owned a business to get the loan, supposedly. They have owned a business, supposedly. They should have had um, employees as well. You could have been a sole proprietor, I would guess, but that you would have had a less amount of money. To get the 10000 you would have had to, because of SBA's rules, proving that you had at least 10 people. And they were, well, what is this money for? And folks weren't able to even say what the money was for. We were just told the government was giving out money. And so people contacted us and they said, you want money? You just have to give us a percentage back. We'll do everything else for you. So they were coming to withdraw the 10000 So scamsters were organizing people to do, yeah. to apply for this money. So social media played a, a huge role in this. That's where we started to see it. And then we started to see the, um, just the, the, the black net, all that. We started to, the dark net, sorry, is where we, we started to really see, wait a minute, this is what's going on. But it was the banks alerting us that got us really looking. After a short break, more with Inspector General Mike Ware. All right, folks, get a jump on meal planning for busy nights with easy, quality, delicious meals from Omaha Steaks. Go to omahasteaks.com and enter the code JUSTNEWS, all one word, into the search bar to order the Deluxe Grill Out assortment package. I just got this at my home. Oh, my God, what an incredible package of food. I'm actually just salivating talking about it. You know why? Because it includes over 30 entrees. You got that right, 30 entrees, like bacon wrap, filet mignon, filet mignon burgers, boneless pork chops, that's one of my favorites, gourmet franks, sides, desserts, and more. Plus, you'll save over 50% and you'll get 12 free burgers. Now that's a deal, I just got it at my house. It is a winning package. These are basically a steak between buns. Make memories with family and friends and give them an experience they will truly cherish when you order Omaha Steaks. It isn't just steak, it's the best steak of your life, and they guarantee it. Go to omahasteaks.com and type in Just News in the search bar to shop the Deluxe Grill Out assortment. It includes over 30 entrees like bacon wrap, filet mignon, filet mignon burgers, gourmet jumbo franks, sides, and so much more. Plus, when you use the code Just News, all one word, you'll save over 50% on your order. That's a great deal. And you're gonna get 12 free burgers on top of it. Wow, what a savings. And to thank our military servicemen and women, you can get an additional 10% off your order at checkout just for serving. Go check it out today at omahasteaks.com. Remember to use the code JUSTNEWS. We're back talking COVID-19 relief fraud with Small Business Administration Inspector General Mike Ware. So they would reach out to them on social media, say the government is giving out money, free money. You don't have to pay it back. It's a grant. They're giving money to anyone. We will facilitate that for you. You just have to give us, some of them it was up to 8,000 out of your 10,000. You'll get 2,000. Half of it would be ours. Half would be yours. Because otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't know about the program. And we do all the work for you. And the bank started to ask just a simple follow-up question. And that's when they realized something was wrong. That's when we dug into it and saw that. So when we started to uncover these schemes and started to bring people in, it was then that we said, oh, this is what the scheme is. If you set up something where you would be checking that 200 loans are coming from the same IP address, maybe you wouldn't have allowed that money to go out. Or they had the same email address or the same physical address. So we just, what we got to the table with with SBA at the onset, with the administrator and her staff from the very beginning was, these are potential cases. There may be an instance where there's a single IP address for 200 applicants. I don't know, (laughs) but you don't know either. All we want you to do is start to ask a follow-up question before the money goes out. Let's start stopping these and asking questions. Did that make a big difference? Can you tell? Well, that's what we're still measuring. What we do know is this. From the onset, they didn't take that seriously. So it was, a, but it could be a reason why. There, there could be a, a, a viable reason why. Our, our, our role here is to get this money out. Who's saying that? So the leadership at SBA at the time. So I was like, yes, but I'm telling you, we have ongoing criminal cases. We have indictments based off this exact fact pattern. So we haven't reviewed every single loan. So I can't tell you which ones are definitely fraud and which ones aren't, but you can't either. 
And I'm telling you that the cases are based off of this. So they're red flags. And I need you to flag those loans and do the due diligence to make sure that they're going to the people who are eligible to receive them. So at first we had a lot of pushback. We had a pushback in the media, pushback to the reports until the, what was it? The third tranche was about to go out. And then they said, they got us to the table and said, all right, we're doing this. And they started to make some changes. On the Paycheck Protection Program um, part of it, when they got the alerts, they were moving almost immediately. I mean, immediate changes. But on the economic injury ones, it was uh, a lot more slower, <laughs> slower to institute the controls. Are there some other repeat patterns that you noticed with either of these programs? besides the one you described, which I think is really interesting and um, probably kind of predictable. Yeah, <laughs> in terms of the social media prevalence or well, in, in terms, terms of, of the... what scams you caught people doing? How, how were people, I read some articles about people, um, you know, getting loans for all their family members. I don't know if it was the loans of the people. I thought some of it was PPP, quite frankly. Yeah. And they were giving it to family members and friends and then buying cars and, you know. There's a way that you could get in past the controls. It's just the due diligence needs to be put in place as a normal control factor. And what happened was from the onset, they were doing batch processing. So, I mean, I think it was like 17 minutes an officer had to review a, a file in order to meet these things because the batches were coming in 200 at a time. So they're trying to get through all that. So that meant a lot of things slip through and that was one of the schemes we noticed when we started to to track what the fraudsters were actually saying bombard them throw as many at the wall as possible and some will get through so we would find where people were applying at 12 different banks for the same loan using the same information hoping that one or two could slip through which would invariably happen so that was going on so that's where you see the stuff but they could also provide true information. They'd have a legitimate business and everything like that, but don't use the money for the purposes that are designated by the act. How That's can, the planes, the cars. How can you go back or do you go back and find out once they get the money if it went to the intended purpose? Right. So that's where law enforcement comes in. That's where we come in and our, our partnerships with law enforcement across the entire government but spectrum. But you can't check every person that got the money. Can't check every person that got the money, which is why it was so critical to have the upfront controls in place to stop as many as possible. We are, we're pretty much overwhelmed in terms of um, how much investigative activity we have going on right now with us joining for forces with the um with the prac joining forces with fbi secret service department of justice with, with 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 everyone just um magnifying the impact as much as possible how hard is it to get money back i noticed there's been quite a bit of money clawed back how does that work so <laughs> well that's that's a good question and the reason is because there's a, a few ways that i could could approach answering it one of them is it could be rather simple when the money is still there and we work with the agency to claw back that we've done to the tune of i think 1.9 billion so the money was still there we were able to pull it back real quick um on the others that are more complicated sba oig we we don't have seizure authority so we work with the secret service to have seizure authority and though they're they're on top of it even putting those agreements in place and getting that work done takes a lot a lot longer than if we go through the agency and are able to pull back so it could be easy or it could be a little bit more difficult okay. but if it's not there yeah you have to find what they bought or see <laughs> right. if there's a way to <laughs> right of all the fraud that you've captured so far is there any way to guess what percentage of it you have versus what percentage of it may have slipped through no way right now. And, and that is something that we are trying our hardest to quantify. We're even working with the PRAC in order to run the, the, the data um, analysis in a way that pulls from our actual cases exactly what was allowed to go through and exactly what we were allowed to mitigate once the controls were put in place. We're trying to put numbers around all that right now. It's, it's, it's really a difficult task. And it was done for the Recovery Act, but it was done way after. <laughs> by, the t by the time all the information came in to run those numbers, it took a while. Anything else you want to say? So 
Where we find ourselves currently in the last tranche that just came out was a real focus on what upfront control mechanisms need to be in place to protect the funds as best we can. That wasn't in place. I mean, think about it. You're right. It was an emergency. And these people worked hard. When these people, I mean, the employees of the Small Business Administration worked hard to get the money out to people who needed it so desperate, desperately. But the balance to be struck between the speed of that and a control environment that ensures it goes to the people who really need it and who are eligible, that balance was just a little bit off center, but it's something that is really being focused on currently. So So I guess that's my last question. After stimulus, there was a lot of talk that, well, now for next time, we'll have systems in place so that we're ready. But then when this happened, I forget another story I did, they kind of said they went through the same routine again. Is there a way to make it where no matter what emergency happens in the future, there's some kind of standard that just kicks in automatically? The only way that that could, could happen is probably through legislation. But what could be done from my seat um, as the Inspector General at the Small Business Administration, as a member of the PRAC, is for us to have a document that is provided for them that these things must be in place before any of these emergency funding mechanisms um, take, take effect. And that's something that we'll definitely be working on. Something we sought to do with the white papers at the onset of this emergency. That was Mike Ware. Inspector General at the Small Business Administration. He says, by the way, in a pretty short period of time, the Small Business Administration hotline got 155,000 tips and complaints about COVID-19 relief fraud. They'd had about 900 in total the whole year before. So 155,000 in just a few months after these COVID-19 relief funds started being spent. My Sunday TV program, Full Measure, will have more on all of this on Sunday, October 31st. And if you'd like to hear more about this topic, well, I have some maddening details of some of the schemes and the cons, the people who are allegedly behind all of this fraud, on my other podcast, Full Measure After Hours, this week. I hope you'll give it a listen. And I hope you'll leave a great review and share it with your friends. Check out all the Just the News podcasts at justthenews.com. And don't forget to subscribe. Do your own research, make up your own mind, think for yourself.